and everything and just had a busy week and so uh, we really appreciate you guys being here. This is not the we got one more session this afternoon. I know you're going to be blessed. And uh, got, when a guy like Jamie sits and listens to a guy like Jeff, it's kind of like throwing gasoline on a fire. He just gets you all kinds of excited, fired up, ready for your turn. So anyway, that was good stuff. You're going to have another good one, but then tomorrow, two more sessions. Now, we want you to go back to your home church tomorrow morning, uh, but if you don't have a home church or if you're in from out of town, come back tomorrow morning. Jeff is going to be sharing again. And then tomorrow night, uh, Generations Church is going to be here with us leading worship, It'd be, and Bishop Jamie's going to be here. It's going to be a great time. So are you ready for round two today? Amen. Are your minds kind of ready? Did, you, did they settle back down and ready for another dose? All right, let's welcome Bishop Jamie Engelhart up this afternoon. Thank you, Pastor Mark. Well, there's a reason I told you that I, I not only just love this young man's heart, but his mind, because his mind will will mess with yours, to say the least. But that was that was some rich stuff. It was very good. And uh, man, the hard thing about following that is, man, my mind's going in a thousand different directions right now. And I say, Lord, have mercy. What, what do you piggyback on? What do you jump on? What do you say? What do you don't say? And uh, that's where uh, Pastor Mark told me. He said, listen, I'm going to have Jeff go first. And he said, you, you know, you've done this a long time. You can just jump on that and piggyback. I said, that, that, that's good. Uh, I'm going to probably hit some of them little metaphors he was talking about and get into some things. But uh, just first, uh, if you guys... When I was here last year, of course, I didn't have actual physical copies of these yet. I know a lot of you maybe have already got them on uh, Kindle or on Amazon. I also have, if you're into more of the Audible uh, version, I actually have an Audible version on my website that I read each of these myths. I read all 70 of them, but then I give about a five-minute commentary on each one. So I, I read them, and so you're kind of getting almost two books in one when you go do the Audible, and you can actually go download that off my website. Uh, otherwise, uh, of course, I have the copies of them. Those of you, I know a lot of you here, you've gotten my USBs in the past. There's 60 some hours of teaching there between all of them. Also, encourage you to take a look at it. Uh, a few of them I've actually, I think, taught here. I think the Blue Series, we did a whole how to how to one of these Saturdays, and we did like four hours just on all that, how to understand the Bible, how to get uh, comprehension out of it. But I encourage you, uh, stop back, grab one of the books. It'll be a blessing to you. Well, man, where do I, where, where do I go from here? First of all, thanks for having me. I always, always enjoy that. Uh, you know, I, I, the one thing I, I really want to piggyback on that I love what Jeff said, and it's something I was going to share already. I, I think any time we're looking at Scripture, uh, it is it is the premise that we start at, and I love that explanation of the logos uh, was just some phenomenal stuff. That how we start has everything to do with how we determine. If you start in Genesis and you go from Genesis to Revelation, then everything you're going to view is going to be more of maybe more of a literal mindset. If you start in Moses, then you're going to view everything through the law. If you if you start uh, if you even start in Matthew, then you might still view some things mixed with some law and grace. But if you start uh, at the cross, at the finished work, start with Jesus as your hermeneutic, which that's mainly the, the, the thing that Jeff was really hitting us on, that the law and the prophets speak of him. And I think, uh, to me, the most amazing picture of it that's found in the New Testament is the Mount of Transfiguration. That on the Mount of Transfiguration, you have Moses, Elijah, and Jesus, the law and the prophets and Jesus, and they're discussing his decease. I mean, I, I would have loved to have been in that conversation. Wouldn't that have been just an interesting conversation, just to pop in there and say, okay, exactly what were y'all talking about? But Peter walks up, and, and Peter does something that was a, a very Jewish thing. It would have actually been, as Jeff was talking about, rather than the uniting thing, a lot of times it's almost the pitting against. And he says, Master, shall we build three synagogues? In other words, should we worship the law? Should we worship the prophets? And then just add Jesus to our religion. Uh, in other words, you know, should, should, we just, uh, should we just have Judaism 2.0 that, that's coming here and instead immediately the father booms from heaven. Moses and Elijah are gone. The father booms from heaven and says, this is my son, hear him. In other words, uh, don't hear them. All right? In other words, their only purpose 
was to point to him because he is the whole point of this in the first place. And it's all about the union between the father and the son. That is why Hebrews tells us that in times past, God spoke to us through the prophets, but now he speaks to us through his dear son. It's not that God doesn't say anything through the prophets, but uh, as Jeff read in Galatians, I mean, he's speaking to them, uh, or as he said in John, that Jesus said, you search the scriptures day and night and you do not you do not find life there, but it first said, you never heard me and you never saw me. I mean, that's, that, that had to, I think, be probably even a little bit more offensive to them because they're like, wait a minute. Uh, of course we've heard because if you are who you claim to be, we claim that we've heard God, but we've heard God through these other men. And, and I love Jesus and Paul were both masters at pulling verses in the Old Testament completely out of their context. And I, and I love that explanation, taking something that maybe God didn't say and actually making it what he said. Uh, you know, you got the one example where Jesus is speaking about the Gentiles and he says, uh, this is about God's blessing on the Gentiles, but the passage he quotes is out of Isaiah where it's talking about actually like a, de a destruction of Gentiles. And Jesus pulls the redemptive passage out of the Old Testament, actually pulls it out of its historical context and says, this is actually what this means. I know this was said, but this is what this means. And so the, the heart of God is always, and, and, and I, I know, man, there's folks that have been rebuking this lately, and I, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm okay. I'm just going to say it. Uh, I, I think we've had way too much bib, Biblians and not enough Christians. I think we've had people that have done a great job of following the Bible, but not really following the heart of Jesus. And, and that has produced, you know, I, I can pull something out of the scripture and beat you over the head with it and totally miss the whole heart of Christ. Uh, there, there, were, there were preachers in the South just 150, 200 years ago in America that were using scripture to justify slavery saying that it was okay to have slaves and using New Testament verses saying, hey, Paul even said to this slave over here, it was okay, make sure that you do this with your master, knowing on the inside that it was immoral, there was something not right about it, that Christ came to set us free. He came to bring liberty and he did not come to bring any type of bondage in any form whatsoever. And, and that is where the law and the prophets speak of him. The sum of the book speaks of him. But let me say this, that doesn't mean everything in the law and everything in the prophets spoke of him. It doesn't mean everything in the book spoke of him. There's a whole lot of verses and they got nothing to do with Jesus. Come on, how many of you know Jesus is not good with sex slaves? All right. He's not okay with taking Babylonian babies, even though they were little heathen, okay, you know, in their mind and dashing their heads on the rock. He, he's not okay with genocide and infanticide. None of that speaks of Jesus on any level. Is it in the Bible? Yes. Did God uh, be okay with having it written down? Absolutely. But, but when we go looking for him, I, you know, he's the pearl of great price. We go mine the minefield of the old to go look through the scriptures. And that's why... Uh, I'm, I'm very careful. Probably It's probably been about 10 years, to be honest with you. And I know there, there, there's people that have issues with this. And again, that's okay, too. I, I stopped calling the Bible the Word of God about 10 years ago. Uh, I, I call it the Scriptures. I call it the Bible. Uh, I believe the Bible contains the Word of God. And, and there's people that will say that means you're a liberal theologian. Uh, but the truth is the Bible contains the Word of God. Not everything in it, God said. Come on. I mean, he, he read to us... <laughs> right there out of Job. Uh, to me, another great example is when Moses, I put this on Facebook a month or two ago, Moses comes down from the mountain after meeting with God, and, and he, he comes down, and God gives him these instructions. God says, I want you to tell the people that I want to meet with them, because God was saying, I want fellowship. I want a kingdom of priests. And he comes down from the mountain, and he says, the Lord says this. Now, on the mountain, God tells him, I want you to prepare the people and sanctify them for three days. And then on the third day, I want you to make sure that, that they're cleansed and their homes are cleansed and they're cleansed. And then the next day, I want them to come and meet with me on the mountainside. So Moses comes down from the mountain, and he says, thus says the Lord. God says, sanctify yourself for three days. He said, then make sure on the third day that you cleanse yourself and no sex with your wives. God decides, I mean, Moses throws in something that God never said nothing to do whatsoever. God never said nothing about you can't have any intimacy. And actually, it showed us that Moses came down from the mountain with that idea of logos. 
come on, rather than this idea of Logos, I, I believe, and, and, and this is something that people could maybe have discussion about, but I believe one of the reasons they said we don't want to go up to the mountain to see him is how can we trust a God that is not into intimacy and oneness in union? And if he says that we can't have intimacy with the one that we love the most, then how can we trust to have any intimacy with him? So just maybe part of, part of the struggle of them wanting law, if you may, instead of relationship is because Moses misrepresented something that God never said. Moses actually made them think that God was this rather than God actually being this. Rather than being family and about intimacy and oneness and union and relationship, instead, God really doesn't want you to actually enjoy relationship with each other. He just wants you instead to keep a bit of rules. Anyway, I thought that was good stuff right there. That one, man, that one, that one's just been stirring in me a whole lot lately. But Moses added that, and it makes you wonder what else Moses added, because then you get into the New Testament, and it says the law came through Moses. It doesn't say the law came through God. It says the law came through Moses. And then Paul writes a couple times, as well as Hebrews, that the law came through angels. I believe it's one of the reasons why one of the passages that Jeff quoted is that Paul said, if anyone comes and preaches another gospel to you, even if it's an angel, don't pay any attention. Maybe because they were used to mediators actually giving them the message rather than them actually hearing from God themselves actually on the inside. And so whenever, whenever we come to interpret Scripture, all of Scripture is important, but not all of Scripture has equal value. But we must view it through the lens of Jesus. He is the Logos. He is the living Logos. He, he is not only, uh, I've had people for years and I want to argue with me that the living word, Jesus, never contradicted the written word. And I mean, that's just so ridiculous. The whole Sermon on the Mount is a contradiction. I mean, the whole Sermon on the Mount is Jesus said, you've heard said. In other words, Moses said this, but I say this. In other words, Daddy and I, who are one, we never said that. Moses did. It, it didn't mean that he, he had an issue with it being written down. He was just coming about it now from a different context, from a different heart, and, and showing us no man has seen God. We didn't go on to read it in John 1, 118. No man has seen God at any time until Jesus who came from the bosom of the Father, revealed him. That means nobody got God right till Jesus showed up. Jesus came to show us what Abba is actually really like. He came to reveal the heart of Father and not just, not just what man thought God was, but who God really was. And so if we, if we don't see that, that is why I love the Old Testament. I love reading it. I mean, I, you know, I've had people want to call me a Marcionite, you know, because well, you just believe. And I said, no, I love the Old Testament, but I go to the Old Testament to find Jesus. I go to the Old Testament to find the word of God in the Old Testament. Why? Because he is all over the place. That's why on the road to Emmaus, he is explaining to them in the scriptures, the only scriptures they had was the Old Testament. So we don't throw the Old Testament out. We just have to know how to interpret, and we interpret through the lens of the one who is the word. He is the logos. It also is logic. I, I, I don't know about you, but being raised in the Pentecostal church, we weren't taught any logic whatsoever. I mean, it wasn't come let us reason together. It was like, no, there was no reasoning whatsoever, and you were called not to use any logic. I think it's interesting that Jesus is quoting Old Testament passages, and he says, love God with all your heart, soul, and strength, but Jesus adds mind in there. Actually, mind wasn't even a part of that passage in the Old Testament, and Jesus is like, listen, man, I am the very logic of God. I want you to use your head, okay? I gave you a mind for a reason use it. All right. And so, you know, don't, don't, don't just function according to, well, bless God, I'm just led by the spirit. And yes, you are, but you have the mind of Christ also. And these things go hand in hand. It's not about just one or the other. It's not either or it's both. And so I, I believe it's extremely important that, that we still find him. I mean, when, when Paul is talking about Scripture, he's talking about the Old Testament. He's talking about the law. He's talking about the prophets, the Old Testament. That's why we still need that, and we also need to mine through the New Testament because there's some stuff even in the New Testament. You know, I mean, Paul even says some stuff. Listen, man, I'm saying this by permission. I'm not even really sure God's saying this, but I'm, I just feel like it's okay for me to say it. And, and we have to even mind through that and still find the heart of God in it because we must start with the premise of God is love. 
above everything else. God is family. God is union. I, I shared uh, last night over in Ada uh, a message out of Isaiah or out of uh, Psalm 51 or Psalm 50 where God said, if I were hungry, he said, I wouldn't tell you. And, you know, the first premise is, can God get hungry? You know, I mean, if God is God and God is all-knowing and all He's omniscient, he's omnipresent, uh, he's all-powerful. Can, can God even get hungry in the first place? And, and does God even need anything? And I was taught my whole life that God is God all by himself and God needs nothing. But I love the way Jeff explained it. God is love and love needs to express itself in community. God has some needs. Love cannot be loved by itself. Love needs to express itself in a family. And so God's like, listen, man, I, I've got my family, Father, Son, and Spirit, but, and I've got all these angels, and I don't really know if I call them as much my family. Um, there might be some arguments with people and that kind of stuff. But he said, I want some just like me in my image and likeness that I create so I can pour love into. And so the whole heart of God has always been about union. John 17, to me, explains it even clearer. Jesus in the Lord's Prayer, what we call the Lord's Prayer is the disciples' prayer because Jesus would have never prayed that prayer. I mean, you know, the bread would have never asked for bread. He would have never said, forgive me for my trespasses. He had none. That was, that was the disciples' prayer. The Lord's Prayer in John 17, he says, Father, and he says this three times, may they be one even as we are one. That's not talking about churches getting together in a city. All right, and everybody agreeing on doctrine. That, that, that might be a part of it. But he said, may they be one even as we are one, I in you and you in me. What he's saying is his greatest prayer is that we would understand the union that the Godhead has, and we actually carry the same thing. We don't jump in and out of his presence. We don't, we don't go to try to find him and chase him and run him down. If, listen, if you're having to chase after your daddy, that means he don't want to pay no child support. I mean, it means you're probably some bastard child that he don't want anything to do with. You don't have to chase your daddy around, okay? He's already right there with you, residing in you. And I think it's so important that we understand that. And so uh, let, let me read. I'm going I'm to just start with Colossians chapter 2. I, I want to talk a little bit about when we go into the Old Testament, things things to look for, and I'm going to talk about the stuff. I'm not going to go to the to the edge, as Jeff says. Sometimes we go in the Old Testament, and we find metaphors for stuff that God ain't in whatsoever, and we try to find meaning for everything. And obviously, there's some stuff in the Old Testament that ain't got nothing to do with Jesus whatsoever, and, and that's okay, all right? But we go find him. Colossians 2, 13 through 17. When you were dead in your sins... And in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ and forgave us all our sins. Now, when did he make you alive? When you were dead. Notice it doesn't say he made you alive when you prayed a prayer. Anyway, I thought I'd throw that in there. And he forgave us all of our sins. When did he forgive our sins? When we were dead in our trespasses. So he forgave you not because you decided one day uh, to think about it and say, hey, I think I want to be forgiven. He forgave you before you even knew you were forgiven. You just needed to come to the reality of it so you could enjoy the blessings of it. He forgave us all of our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross, having disarmed the powers and authorities and made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to religious festival, a new, a new moon celebration or Sabbath days. These are a shadow. Everybody say shadow. These are a shadow. It actually is translated shade, darkness, or outline. These are a shadow of things to come, but the reality, however, is found in Christ. And so I, I want to talk about just a shadow to substance, that, you know, everything in the Old Testament was a shadow. Why? Because in the Old Testament, they were looking towards something. In the New Testament, we look back at something. We're not looking for something to come. We're looking at that which has already been done, that which has already been completed. That's why we are now not in the dark looking at the light. We are in the light looking back at the dark. In the old, they were in the dark, and they were looking towards the light. And so all they saw was shadows, and those shadows were hidden all through Scripture. You know, I, I, I love what, you know, Jess said that, you know, uh, Jesus is quoting, and he's talking about the resurrection, and he said all these things have been in Scripture. You know, I've been meditating a little bit lately on, on Jonah. And, you know, we always get this picture, of course, you know, Jonah and a whale. And I saw a little cartoon the other day on Facebook where it was like in a class 
uh, and it was a, a child asking like a, a Sunday school teacher a question and they were talking about Jonah and the child says it's absolutely impossible for a human to fit down the throat of a whale. He said it, it actually it, it's like an impossibility and, and, and the teacher says something back like well you know God with God all things are possible and they can do it and the child's like okay whatever I'm just telling you that I, I learned that no matter how big the mouth is of that whale its throat could not it could not fit a human and a human couldn't live in there and, 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 and it dawned I mean, not too long ago, that actually Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the Son of Man. And he said, your only sign you're going to get is the sign of Jonah, who is in the belly of the whale three days and three nights. And that lets me know something. If Jesus, who was in the earth three days and three nights, it means Jonah died. All right. I think we have this little picture of he's inside the whale and he's got a little fire going and he's camping and he's sitting there complaining. Come on, I mean, you know, when I was in Sunday school, that's kind of the picture I got. But it means he got ate up maybe by a fish and he died and he got resurrected three days later because that's what happened to Jesus. All right. It never says he was alive in the fish, just said he got swallowed by a fish. And so there's pictures of resurrection. We know a lot of that's a metaphor. Some believe it's literal. I don't, I don't even care. You know, I don't want to get in discussions with people about whether you have to literalize all that. But, but there's a picture there of resurrection. And Jesus goes and pulls this story out that for many of them maybe was even a myth or a fable. And he's like, this is the sign that you're going to get. This is what is going to happen to me. It's the very same thing that happened to Noah. He was three days and through Jonah, for some reason I want to say Noah. Jonah, three days and three nights in the belly of a whale. And then he's going to begin to come alive. All of those things uh, were all shadows. Romans 15, 4 tells us whatever things were written before were written for our learning that we through the patience and the comfort of the scriptures may have hope. 1 Corinthians 10, 11, now all these things happened to them as examples and were written for our admonition for whom the end of the ages has come. Notice not will come, but the end of the ages has come. That means the ages was finished. Not now. It was finished a while ago. And so I, I, what I want to look at is just a few, a few things that have always stuck out at me, probably one of my favorite things to talk about. And over the last year especially, uh, this has just been exploding in me. I'm actually, uh, I'm actually working on uh, my second book, and it's going to be called God's Offspring, and uh, how every human carries the DNA of God, they just don't know it. And uh, especially the idea of Christ in you, in you is really not a good translation. It's actually Christ in and among all of us. The hope of glory. Glory there, doxa in the Greek, is translated honor, value, worth, and approval. So Christ in you, and he calls it the mystery that was hidden from the ages, and it was a mystery to Gentiles. And the mystery spoken to the Gentiles is Christ is in you, and it gives you a hope of value, worth, and approval. In other words, it's not Christ to you, it's Christ in you. In other words, our message to Gentiles is Christ is in you. So we preach to the, not to the sin in them, we preach to the, to the sun in them. We, 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 we see Christ in there, and then we begin to see all of these pictures. And I want to talk about glory, and I want to talk about it not in the charismatic way, because I've gone in churches, and, you know, they got signs when you come in the sanctuary, you're entering the glory zone. You know, the moment I, the moment I walk into a church like that, I'm going, oh, boy. I mean, it means somebody's going to be waving something, and something's going to get a little spooky, and they're going to sing songs I never heard in my entire life. I've, 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 been, I've, I've experienced some strange stuff in church, trust me. And, and sincere people, I mean, no doubt, love God. They're precious. Uh, help me, Jesus. It, it's, just, it's just not my, my flow, okay? I mean, normally I get around that, and I'm like, oh, Father. I, I, I already know right here, uh, you know, there, there, there's going to be NASCAR ladies with flags, and, uh, you know, I just... And, and listen, if, if you love that, listen, I'm gonna knock yourself out. It's just, it's just all I think of, you know. It's like, you know, hurry up, get quicker, speed down. Oh, we're trying. God, here you go. Come on down. Come on down. You know, it's like, uh, like, like, like we have to work something up to get God to actually manifest uh, in the building. Uh, Old Testament glory and New Testament glory were different things. Old Testament glory... It dealt with kabod. It was weightiness. It was heaviness. It was it was the blue smoke that was 
between the, the cherubim. It was, uh, it was when the glory of God would come in, people couldn't stand. And, and, and we still tend to get excited about that glory. It's like, man, the glory of God was so powerful. I could barely stand in the meeting. I, I, I remember preaching uh, back in the mid-90s when all the revivals were going on. And I walked into a church, and uh, as a church he knows a little bit about it, I talked to him about it not too long ago, and the pastor said to me, man, I ain't been able to preach for six months. The glory of God's been so strong in here. And, and so I preached for an hour. Uh, <laughs> And I was like, listen, if the glory of God's so strong you can't stand, listen, man, knock yourself down, lay down everything else. If you can lay it around for an hour or two, you can stay for another hour and 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 and, and get some life in you. <laughs> And get some good teaching because, because you know what? All those experiences are good, but the experiences wear off. And it's ultimately what's going to transform your life is the renewing of your mind. And so if you never take any time to get your mind renewed, all that other stuff is just, it's just going to lead to a lot of fun, but it's not going to bring real, real lasting change. And so uh, I want to go back in the Old Testament, and I want to look at a passage uh, and, and see Christ in, in, in some beautiful ways. Of course, all through the Old Testament, we see him in pictures of everything from lambs to water uh, to, to rocks to all, all the beautiful metaphors that Christ is, is hidden and he gets revealed and all of those things. And yes, we could take some of them way too far. I mean, I've, I've heard people preach some stuff and I'm like, man, listen, that's a stretch if I ever, if I ever heard a stretch. But there's some things that Paul even made clear to us, where Paul is talking about the rock in the Old Testament that they drank out of, and he says the rock was Christ. And, and actually, in the Old Testament, it says that the rock followed them around. You know, I mean, I, I remember as a kid thinking, you know, like, is that literal? Like, they had a pet rock that just kind of, you know, I, I mean, when he just, you know, cheer rock here. I mean, literally, a rock just followed him everywhere. I mean, that, that's kind of a strange passage right there, if you think about it. But obviously, the rock was Christ, and, and it was God that was constantly releasing. Now, it might have been out of a little rock. I don't know. It might have been literal. All I do know is the rock was Jesus Christ, and there's a reason why it's a picture of Jesus, because uh, the Apostle Paul, when he tells us the rock was Christ, that when Moses first got to the rock, he struck the rock and the water flowed. But 20 years later, God gives him instruction, and he said, I want you to speak to the rock. But because we're creatures of habit and what God did 20 years before, he's obviously got to do this time. And so he hits the rock. When God never told him to hit the rock, he told him to speak to the rock. And the reason that is important is simply because Christ the rock was smitten one time. You don't have to constantly beat him to get him to release life to you. He was smitten once and for all, and we don't do that anymore. All we have to do is speak. That is why Romans 10 says, the righteousness that is of faith does not say, I will ascend to heaven and bring God down here. In other words, we can beg God to drop out of the sky all day long, but that's not the righteousness that is of faith. Or it does not say, I'll ascend into the deep and bring him up, but the word is nigh you even in your mouth. In other words, he's as close as the mention of his name. In other words, he, he's a very present help in time of trouble. All you have to do is speak now, and the rock will begin to manifest life to you. As the kingdom of God is voice activated, but Moses is crying out to God one day, and he says, show me your glory. God, show me, show me your glory. And God says some very interesting things, and I, I just, this just has been stirring in me all morning, so I just want to release it to you because it's fun. Is that all right? I just I like seeing Christ in the Old Testament and let him reveal that life to us because if all I do is just, is just think that all God did was stick him actually in an actual cliff and, and then put his hand over him and he got some kind of little vision of God's behind, uh, you know, I mean... <laughs> Uh, if that's all there is to this, then, then there's something, obviously, that there's more to it. But he says, God, show me, show me your glory. And God says this to him. He said, no man can see me and live. He said, but there is a place. Everybody say place. He said, there is a place beside me. I, I, I love that it doesn't say there's a place in front of me. He didn't say there's a place beneath me. He didn't say there's a place behind me. He doesn't say there's a place above. He said there is a place beside me. In other words, if you want to see the glory, no man can see me and live, but there is a place beside me that you can actually experience the glory. I don't know about you, but I don't think it's an accident why we are told in the New Testament that Jesus is seated 
at the right hand of majesty on high, that there is a place beside that it is in Christ that we begin to experience the glory because Paul said, Jesus is the glory of the Father, we are the glory of the Son, and woman is the glory of man. That, that the real glory is a person, it's not some smoke, it's not an experience, it, it's, it's living and in breathing and having our, our being in him. Then he, he says this. He said, you want me to show your, me your glory. In other words, you want me to come down to where you are or you want to ascend to where I am. And he said, I want to give you a little secret. All of you are trying to get to me. My passion has always been to get to you. You're trying to get here, and it's always been my desire to be there. That is why God came in the garden, walking with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day. His desire was always to tabernacle with us, always to be with us. Emmanuel, God with us. And he said, but there is a, a place, if, if you want me to then be where you are, then you've got to build me this place. And I'm going to get there in a second because God's presence dwelled in a tent that had an outer court and an inner court and a most holy place. But he said, if there's a place beside me, and in this place beside me, uh, that's where you get a revelation of me. And then it says that God took him and hid him in a rock. He hid him in the cleft of the rock or put him in a cliff. I, I don't believe that. It, maybe he put him in a literal cliff, but we know what he was revealing to us now in the new covenant is that he was actually showing Moses that when you get in Christ, that's how you really see where the glory is. And then it says God put his hand over Moses because the purpose, every time I see hand, I'm immediately thinking of the fivefold ministry gifts because the purpose for the fivefold ministry gifts is to equip the saints. The word equip means to set a bone in order. In other words, it's to help people find where they fit in the body of Christ. And the greatest job of fivefold ministry gifts is to reveal to people who they are in the rock. Ultimately, it's to bring you to a place of you understanding your sonship, that your identity is set in him, your identity is sealed in him. It doesn't matter if you're an apostle, a prophet, an evangelist, a pastor, or a teacher. Whatever the grace is on your life, our main job is to reveal to people who they are in him. And then when we get out of the way, the only thing they see is his goodness. So it is about us helping people find who they are in him and in his body, where they fit in the body, revealing to them who they are in Christ, and that is the number one job. It's not to cover them, to try to smother them. It's to reveal him and them in him, and then we get out of the way because they come to a place of some maturity, and what they see above everything else is his goodness, and it says that Moses then, what he saw was he saw the hinder parts of God, some translations in the Hebrew actually show that he saw the ending from the beginning. In other words, he saw a picture of Christ because Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega, the author and the finisher. Huh? I think it's interesting that actually he prays that prayer and he had to wait almost 1,800 years to actually see the manifestation of it. He says, God, show me your glory. And he says, well, there's this place and let me put you in a rock and let me... Let me help them, cause my goodness to pass by you. But then about 1,800 years in the future, uh, he's sitting in Sheol, and he's sleeping with his fathers, and all of a sudden his name gets called, and he, he pops up to the Mount of Transfiguration, and he begins to see the glory of God. For the first time, he really has a clear vision, and him and Elijah are having a conversation, and he's seeing the glory of God manifested right there, right in front of him. Because the glory is found in a person, not found, it's not just found in a book, it's not just found in passages, it's found in Christ. And so when we want to see Christ in Scripture, then we're constantly mining the field and we're looking for the pearl because he is the pearl. We view it all through the lens of who he is and his goodness. We don't look at it through the lens of, of God being angry and wrathful. Jeff said it so well. I've heard many others say it, that the Bible is like a Rorschach test, which is a test that shows you more about you than it does anything else. It is a reflection of your heart. I can always tell anytime, you know, I'll put something, I'll pr preach something or say something like God is love. And there's always people that will jump on and say, yeah, but. 
Yeah, God is love, but God is also, he's also a God of justice. He's a God of wrath. He's also this and he's also that. And, and, and all of that is true, but that's not the beginning of who he is. Those are all descriptions of parts of him, but the truth is even his wrath is based on love. His justice is mercy and compassion. All of it is still based on the foundation, and the foundation is the family love, and it's based on relationship in union. If you don't start from that premise, then you're going to read into it whatever you want to read into it. And the truth is this, we can use Scripture to do anything we want. I mean, there's enough Scripture. I mean, there's enough battling Scriptures. I mean, you know, you got, I mean, you got, you got Paul. I mean, we don't give Paul room to grow. I mean, he's writing some of this stuff after he'd only known Christ about eight years. And then 20, 30 years later, he's writing almost the opposite stuff. Jerusalem Council, he says, yeah, listen, this is what we're going to agree to. The Gentiles are not going to, they're not going to eat any food offered to idols. And, the, and then you read about 20 years down the road, hey, it's all right. Just go ahead and eat the food offered to idols. Why? Because he's growing. He's also maturing. God is speaking some fresh things to him. I believe there's a reason why we're told to continue in the apostles' doctrine. I don't believe apostles' doctrine is just you have to have an apostle preach it to you. The word apostolos means moving or it means sent. In other words, Peter called it present truth. What is sent doctrine? It's constantly evolving, that God is constantly speaking through all of the ages and the ages to come. God is constantly, I love what I heard one writer said. He said that actually about every hundred years, we need to have the Bible retranslated for us because we're constantly getting new information. We're getting new understanding. And, and it's amazing that everything else on the earth seems to evolve, but we're terrified to touch the Bible. I mean, I, I, I don't know why that is. I mean, truth is, I, I've had people want to argue with me. And it's like, well, you just can't pick and choose out of the Bible what you want. And I'm like, well, you know, if your Bible is 66 books, you already did. Because the original one was 80. All right. You know, then the Orthodox shifted that to like 81. Some other folks dropped it to like 73. And, and actually, do you know that the original 1611 King James Version was actually 80 books? And it wasn't until 1881 that it went down to 66. 1881. So it wasn't just a Catholic and a Protestant thing. Actually, the early church, the, the church fathers of the Protestant movement, most of them actually taught out of the Geneva Bible, which was 80 books. So the truth is, we already kicked a bunch of stuff to the curb. And, and now we're just freaking out when other stuff is happening. People are saying, don't touch. Oh, hallelujah. The, the, the Holy Writ, but yet the truth is we know stuff today that they didn't know 200 years ago. There's things that are evolving and transforming. Uh, that, that's why I, I love to always give, I love to give the picture in the Old Testament that, uh, you know, Joshua cries out to God one day and he's in the middle of a battle and he says, God, listen, in order for me to win this battle, I need the sun to stand still. And what God doesn't say to him is, that, listen, son, you're a moron. You know, because the sun always stands still. All right, you know, you don't know what you're talking about. You know, you need, you need to take a good science class. I mean, the, 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 that day, all they knew, even scientifically, is that it is the sun that revolved around the earth, and we know it is the earth that revolves around the sun. Now, we know that today. Galileo got house arrest for that, I mean, a good portion of his life, and ended up actually dying, and the church calling him a heretic because of that. But, but yet, instead, God's mercy and grace, rather than saying, listen, you idiot, you don't know what you're talking about, instead, he just had... As the sun, he has the earth stand still and makes him think the sun stood still. Why? Because God is so patient with us. And he's like, listen, man, you are evolving. And as you are evolving, so is truth. Truth is constantly moving in a right direction, but truth is founded and based in this family love. If it's not based in love, then it begins to fall apart and it begins to crumble. And it's okay for us to realize that there are some things, there's a lot of things uh, there's things I taught last year that I don't teach this year. That was a good place for an amen. Huh? There's some things. I probably need to go back through them USBs, and I need to throw a couple of them out and redo a few stuff because there's some stuff even just today. I mean, I'll be in the middle of a sermon sometimes and stop and say, wait a minute, everything I just said the last four minutes, I don't believe none of that anymore. Because when you've been indoctrinated your whole life to think a certain way, it, it it, it says, as, as, Jeff, as, as Jeff said to us, you know what? You get to that place where your whole life you were taught that this was the norm, and then you begin to realize that's not the norm, that, that, that Jesus is the norm, and Jesus taught us to love our enemies. And I think it's interesting that he tells us to love our enemies and not his because maybe he doesn't have any. 
How do, how do we know that? Because no greater love is this than a man laid down his life for his friends and he laid down his life for everybody so he has no enemies. We were enemies of God in our minds, alienated. God doesn't have any enemies. From his perspective, he only has friends. From our perspective, we have enemies. And he said, love your enemies, not love, not love his enemies. Why? Because everything is continually changing, transforming. God is, is speaking present truth that is constantly flowing, and he's letting us know that there's some stuff that we believed that we thought was present truth that is not the preceding word, but it is the preceding word. It's what God said. It's not what he's saying. That's why I can pull all kinds of stuff out of the Old Testament and preach it today and, and say this is what God is saying, and God isn't saying any of that whatsoever. But then there's some stuff in the Old Testament I can pull out that God actually is saying today because he's taking something he said, breathing on it fresh, and making it something he's saying. That, that's the beauty. That's the beauty. I've, I've used this example many times before. But uh, I remember years ago uh, I, was at a, I was at a large conference. I was at a, at a general council. And... Uh, one of the speakers got up, and his, his, his message that night was about healing. And he got up, and he started talking about how when he was in his early 60s, he had been diagnosed with a heart disease. And uh, so he had everybody he knew prayed for him. He said he, he even went, uh, this was back, back in the 80s, so he even went, late 80s, he went to a Benny Hinn meeting, and, you know, this is when Benny was blowing on everybody and throwing his coat, and he didn't even agree with any of that. But you get desperate enough, you don't care. It's like breathe on me, spit on me, you know, sling snot, I don't care. I mean, you know, if you, you're desperate enough for healing, you don't care. You just want to get healed. And he said he was about a month away from where the doctor said, you know, you got like one month left to live, and he was, he was reading the scriptures. And he's reading in Psalms, and in Psalms, David says, Oh, God, my heart is fixed. All of a sudden, he stopped, and he looked at it again, and the Holy Spirit said, Read that again. And he says, Oh, God, my heart is fixed. And the Holy Spirit exploded that off the page to him, and literally he got up and he said, My heart is fixed. He went out and he started mowing the lawn. His wife comes home, and she's all, What are you doing? You're like on your deathbed. He said, You don't understand. God told me this morning, reading Psalms, my heart is fixed. Now, that passage has nothing to do with your actual heart being fixed. What he's saying is, my, my focus is on you, God, to have your heart fixed. It's like being down here in the South and say, I'm a fixin' to go to eat, all right? You don't affix to anything, all right? I, I don't understand. Living in the North, we don't know what affixin' to means, all right? We don't, we don't affix to anything. We go do it. We don't affix to go do it. But, but when he said, my heart is fixed, he's saying, man, my mind is focused. My vision is clear. But then smack dab in the middle of that, 2,000 years or three, 4,000 years in the future, God, by his Holy Spirit, because of his love, breathes on that passage and heals the man's heart. Now, the problem is, is if he goes and tries to teach that as doctrine. Because God took something he said and made it what he was saying because that's his prerogative. And out of his love for that man, he took a passage that didn't even mean that and he breathed on it to bring healing because he's the healer. You don't, you don't punish sickness out of people. You heal it. Um, that's why it, it's not wrath that's going to heal you. It's love that is going to heal you and transform you. That is the heart of God and always has been. And that's why I, I, I've told people now for years, I said, listen, in your personal devotions, when you're reading the scriptures, the Holy Spirit can breathe on something that's so far out of its historical context that doesn't mean that whatsoever, but it's going to mean something directly to you that you need that day because it's something that comes alive in you. It's living. It's breathing. The, the living logos makes the written logos become a reality and a revelation in your life, but then don't go and then try to teach it and preach it as the meaning. And pretty much in the Pentecostal charismatic world, that's how we were taught how to preach. You know, you just get before God that week and you pray and whatever you see, that's what it means. No, that's not what it means. All right, it, it might have been a good application for somebody that was in that service. It might have blessed you. That's why we got all kinds of charismatic books that were written that God might have given an individual a revelation, but then they wrote the revelation down and screwed up a whole bunch of other folks that tried to take their revelation uh, that God gave them and make it a revelation to them, and it didn't mean anything to them, and it actually ended up bankrupting a lot of people and messing some folks up. Right, there's a lot of stuff that was written in the 80s and 90s 
that we then tried to take some of them little booklets and, and, and we tried to do what brother so-and-so did and, and, and it just didn't work. All right, why? Because it was a revelation to that person at the time that they needed to it, but then they tried to make it a revelation of the whole body of Christ. And, and that's where when we discover Jesus, it's always going to be in the context of his goodness, his mercy, and his his character. So let me let me get a let me get back to Moses. He said, "God, show me your glory." And he said, "If you want to see my glory, there's a place beside me." In other words, there's there's a place by me that you need to see to be able to see this glory. Puts him in the rock. He puts his hand over the rock. He moves his hand out of the way, and he sees. God's goodness pass by. It's always his goodness he's going to reveal to you. But then you go through the rest of the Old Testament, and it's a picture because God then tells Moses, this is what I want you to do. He said, I want you to build this tent of meeting, and I want you to build me a place because you want me, uh, you want to experience me, and you want to experience my glory, but my glory is going to be behind this veil, and it's going to be in the place that you make and you build for me. They then prepare the place and the tent of meeting gets done and God gives directions to Moses and he says this. He said, I want you to take Aaron, the high priest, and I want you to, I want you to slaughter all these animals and all these sacrifices. That's why I've said God's a carnivore. Because he didn't say, bring me a bunch of lettuce. He said, I want you to bring me all kinds of bulls and goats and lambs. And whew. he's like, I want a buffet, baby. I want, <laughs> I want, I want some meat up in here. I'm, <laughs> I'm a car. Bring me all, the, bring me all this, bring me all this meat. And he said, but then I want you to take blood. And Aaron took blood and he, he sanctified. He consecrated the place where God would began to reside in on the earth. Actually, it actually says he took blood and he sprinkled everything. We're talking the temple, the tabernacle of Moses was a bloody mess. It was covered in blood. All the utensils, the altars, the, the, uh, I mean, the, the altar, the, the, the labor of washing. He goes in to the Holy of Holies, peels back the veil, puts blood on the mercy seat. I mean, covered the place in blood because if the high priest, Aaron, had not prepared the place, then the priesthood would have no access to the place. And so all through the Old Testament, we see this picture of only the high priest once a year to be able to go in, peel back the veil, and actually be able to experience that glory, except during the temple of Solomon when he built it. And they had, uh, they had the 120 priests that were declaring the glory of God and singing, and they experienced the glory as it was then coming into the temple. Now, back then, it was a picture of this smoke and a picture of a feeling and, and a weightiness and a heaviness. But, but ultimately, it was showing us a picture of who Christ was because his desire was always to reside in the temple. It wasn't his desire to just come visit every once in a while and there'd be a visitation and there'd be a revival. His plan and his purpose was always, I want to reside not only with you, ultimately, I want to reside in you. I want a tabernacle with man. And so Jesus shows up, and he is the glory of God. And he shows up, and, and, and he is showing what a man with God inside, who's manifesting incarnationally, can function like on the earth while actually having glory residing on the inside of him and manifesting it. So he's healing the sick. He's raising the dead. He's casting out devils. He's raising people from the dead and, and all these incredible things. But then we get to a passage in John, and Jesus is actually using high priestly language, and he's actually going back to Moses. When he says this, and, and we've written songs about it, he said, in my father's house are many rooms. Uh, mansions is a horrible translation. There's many rooms. How many know father's house is a three-room house? He's not talking about your house. He's talking about Father's house. In my Father's house are many rooms. There's an outer court, an inner court, and a holy of holies. Daddy has a three-room house. That is the house he's talking about. He's using tabernacle language. And then he says this. He said, if it were not so, I would have told you so, for I go to prepare a place for you. And if, if I go, I'm going to come again and receive you to myself, for where I am, there you shall be also. 
In the Old Testament, only the high priest could go in and actually experience the presence of God unless God would sovereignly, you know, manifest himself on someone like, like, like Moses or like David experienced and Isaiah experienced. No, but your average person, they, they didn't even have that kind of access to anything. And all of a sudden, Jesus shows up and Jesus said, listen, he gets into high priestly language and he said, I as the high priest, I'm going to go prepare the place. So where I am, now you also can be. In other words, and I love this analogy in this picture, Jesus then goes to the cross, he rises from the dead, Mary goes to touch him, he said, don't touch me because I've not yet ascended to the place because that was a symbol, that was a shadow. I'm now the substance and he carries his blood into the heavenly tabernacle that was the real tabernacle. He pours his blood on the mercy seat. He, the high priest, sprinkles the tabernacle with blood because if the high priest did not prepare the place, then the priesthood did not have access to the place. And how many know we are a royal priesthood? How many know you and I have access to the place because our heavenly high priest went and prepared the place. He not only prepared the place, he then returned. That's not something in the future. That happened a few days later. He walks through a door and he breathes the place into them and they now not only have access to the place, they're now in the place because when he died, we all died. When he was raised, we were all raised, and now we're all seated with him in the place, and now we function not from the earth. We actually function from the heavens because we're seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We are in him. He is in us. That is why then Peter and John could be the guys that walk around and say, hey, silver and gold we don't have, but who we have, the actual Greek says, we give unto you. In other words, we can release the place because as a priesthood, we have now become the place. Know ye not, know ye not, you are the naos of God. God. Now he's living on the inside of you and Christ in you is the hope of glory. In other words, now we rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. And now, now we are the dispensers of glory because if he hadn't prepared the place, we wouldn't have access to the place. And then he had to let us know, and listen to this close, he had to let us know a mystery that he was always in the place. Because the mystery hidden from the ages is Christ in you. The only thing that needed to be dealt with at the cross was the veil had to get out of the way. We had a veil over our minds. The truth is, man, I, I always used to teach, and I'm, ooh, I might be treading on some water here, but I always used to teach that God couldn't get in in the Old Testament because they had that veil. But yet John was born and was filled with the Holy Spirit in his mother's womb. So there had to be a way for God to get in there. Maybe God was always there. And what needed to get out of the way was the veil that revealed him because he was always in our spirit. He was always in the Holy of Holies. He was always in the temple. But once the veil got removed from our minds, that's when Christ in you is revealed, that we reveal the Christ in people rather than everybody's got a hole in their heart that's God-shaped. Maybe there's not a God-shaped hole. Maybe there's just a veil. That's why Paul could write in 2 Corinthians 3, anyone that turns to Christ, the veil is removed. And then what happens? Paul said on the Damascus Road that Christ was revealed in him, not revealed to him. Maybe, maybe if our message, because the truth is what people are saying to us is show us his glory. And his glory is residing on the inside of them, and they don't even know it. Because Jesus came to bring many sons to glory, to honor, to value, to worth, to approval. He wants you to know that, listen, you're approved of me. Why? Because I forgave you, and I quickened you, and I made you alive before you ever even prayed a prayer, before you were ever even thought of. This was finished 2,000 years ago because what the cross needed to do was get the veil dealt with. That is why when he breathed his last breath, it said the veil in the temple was rent from top to bottom. It really wasn't about the temple over in Jerusalem. It was about know ye not, know ye not not. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And he said, now I've always wanted to reveal myself in you. You just didn't know it. That is why the heart of, heart of Moses was really saying, please reveal the Christ in the rock and the me in the rock who is Christ. Remove this 
remove this wrong way of thinking, remove these wrong ideas. Instead, show us that he's always been there. Man, that's, I got to be honest with you, that's been rocking me a little bit lately because in the temple, he was there. He wasn't seen. He wasn't revealed. Only one guy, once a year, could experience him. But now, because Jesus, our heavenly high priest, made the way, we as a royal priesthood, we not only have access there, but there. You see, I believe the veil was rent in the temple, not so we could get into heaven, but so heaven could be revealed in us. It was so we could finally actually awaken to the reality that his image has always been in humanity. And where he always dwelled was in man's spirit, but we were dead in our trespasses and sin. That just meant there was a veil there, man. We couldn't see him. It was sleeping. Do you know that Jesus actually called death sleep? All that was going on, it was like your spirit was asleep. It, wasn't, it didn't cease to exist. I mean, people said, well, you were born with a dead spirit. It's like, well, that's impossible. I mean, because I am spirit, soul, and body. Spiritual death was just sleeping. That's why Jesus said, Talitha, she's not dead. She's just asleep. Awake, oh sleeper. Rise from the dead. In other words, awaken to a reality that's already true because Christ is already there. And if you want to know what the glory is, the glory of God is Christ and Moses, if you want to see my glory, get in the rock and realize the rock has always been in you. And then I'm going to show you my goodness because the more you see his goodness, man, I'm telling you, the more I see his goodness, it's impossible for me to have the us and them mentality. It becomes impossible. I don't have any I got to be honest with me, man, my A personality, I would fight you at the drop of a hat. I'm missing some teeth for a reason. It ain't because I'm a blue neck from Michigan. I don't call us rednecks because they don't get that hot up there. We're blue necks in Michigan. Uh, I, I had some teeth knocked out of me, okay? Listen, I, I had no problem fighting, man, no problem brawling, and, and I enjoyed it. I ain't lying. I enjoyed it. But it's like all the fight just has gone out of me. It's like you want to fight, you win. I'm good, man. I, I just I don't I don't even have the desire to anymore because the more Christ is revealed, the more I find him uh, in the scriptures, the more I realize that he's always been good. It wasn't just that all of a sudden that he changed his mood and his mind when Jesus showed up. But the truth is, all linked through there, his grace was there, his goodness was always there. And that when Jesus showed up, he came to reveal Christ in us, the hope of glory. That's why he sees Nathaniel, and rather than make fun of Nathaniel and speak to his mess, he says, behold, a man in whom there is no guile. He speaks to this purpose in him. He sees that key us in a tree and he doesn't say you filthy rotten stinking little heathen you're going to hell in a handbasket repent and get down here right now instead his response is I must come to your house in other words I, I, I'm, I'm, my table is getting spread wide I don't care what you did I don't care how jacked up you are because the word Zacchaeus means pure in other words Jesus saw something pure in him that nobody else saw they just saw a robber and a thief and a tax collector but he said man I see something in you you don't even see in yourself that's why the more that we experience him the more that we know him, the more that we see him in his goodness and just being ugly towards people, you don't really have an excuse anymore. I, I don't have an excuse. I don't have any desire to sit around and fight and argue theology with someone that doesn't even know what I'm talking about because we're starting from two different beginning points. I mean, we're, 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 I, mean I, I looked at a pastor who I love. <laughs> I mean, like really love. I've known him my whole life. And looked at him one day, and I was like, it's not that we're on different pages. I'm not sure we're in the same book. <laughs> because the lens is still seeing it through, through that logos of Heracles or whatever. He does good at I got Hercules down path. I know that. <laughs> That's good to pronounce it all their words, man. That wordsmith. Because when we come about it, when that's the beginning point, 
Remember the beginning point is that God is love. And that perfect love removes all fear. That means if you even attack me, rather than being afraid and responding out of fear, instead of respond out of love because that's, that's the heart of God towards us. He doesn't freak out when we freak out. We get in the middle of storms and we try to bail ourselves out and he gets in the middle of the storm and he goes to sleep. He's like, I'm good, man. You know what? I told you we're going to the other side. I never told you the boat was going. <laughs> now, when you get in the midst of, of, of what you think is impossible situations, like, listen, man, the boat might sink, but uh, you're going to get to the other side because I said... You're going to the other side, regardless of the circumstances and what it looks like, because I'm either going to have you float to the other side, walk on water to the other side, or I'm going to cause a fish to swallow you and spit you on the other side. But if I said you're going to the other side, you're going to make it to the other side. And the more that I reveal and more I understand his goodness, the more, the more I open up the scriptures and I begin to see that he is the rock in a weary land, that he's the cornerstone and he's the chief capstone, that he's the author, he's the finisher, he's the alpha, he's, he's the omega, he's the amen. He's the amen. He's the one that pronounces uh, the, the, the beginning point on it. I've got, a, I've got a friend of mine in Australia and I preach for him. He's a real big guy. He, he like works out a lot. He's got huge arms. And in Australia, they say amen. And I told him, I said, that, that's what women say. Men say amen. Women say oh, amen. <laughs> yeah, man, he gets highly offended. <laughs> I'd love to mess with him on that. But Jesus is, he is, he declares the final amen over our life. And the more that I view everything through the lens, through the lens of him, I, I see glory and it doesn't have to be some goofy weird thing. It's Jesus. I can see. I, 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 will, I will never forget about 10 years ago at my conference up in Michigan, and we had Dr. Lynn come. And Lynn got up and he, he uh, preached his kind of famous message on scabola, which is the Greek word for crapola, but a little more intense. And he was the, he's the only person I know that could find Jesus in poop. I mean, he, he got preaching. I was like, man, these are, these are my favorite people on the planet all come here. And, you know, what are you, what are you telling the people that I love? What is going on here? And all he's talking about is, you know, that you had three million Israelites go out on a camping trip. None of them wanted to go camping. And the, peop, the people at the back of the line were experiencing something different than the people at the front of the line. Because the people at the front of the line, they were, they were building the porta potties The people at the back of the line, you know, we, we don't think about some of that stuff, do we? We're like three million people out on a camping trip with no porta potties Lord have mercy. You know. If you're if you're about 2.5 million back, man, that, that that trip's getting smelly real quick. <laughs> I, I think there's even a reason. I don't know if you thought of this, but there's a reason why when God gave Moses direction to go out in the wilderness, He told him not to take any rabbits. You ever thought about that? He said, "No, I mean, you know, I can't take my pet rabbit." He said, "Don't take any rabbits with you." There was a reason for that, is because it wasn't until I think 17 or 1800s a German discovered germs. All right, and so actually, in an open toe society, that that do you, do you know that if you have a cut on your foot and rabbit urine actually is one of the most harmful to you, actually can kill you. So Jesus said, "Don't take any rabbits because if if you got sandals on and you got a cut on your toe and you step in some rabbit urine, it could kill you." All right, listen. When God gave some of those directions, some of them don't make sense. I'm like, man, I like rabbits. How come I can't take a rabbit? You know, you know, there was some little girl saying, Mommy, I can't take my rabbit. You know, I mean, what's the big God was doing it. He was trying to protect them, okay? He was actually giving some wisdom in, in the process. But Lynn gets, he, he reads the passage, and, you know, uh, he always reads the King James. And he gets to the passage, and, and it says uh, that God gave direction to Moses and said, Whenever the people need to uh, ease themselves, that's a nice way of saying take a deuce. Whenever they have to ease themselves, go outside the camp and had the men put little like pooper scoopers on the edge of their, 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 their shields and dig a hole, ease thyself abroad. That's what the King James says, ease thyself abroad. And nobody says it funnier than he does because you all know how funny he is. Ease thyself abroad and then cover it up. And I mean, and his message was it's time to get the crap out of the camp. And I was like, okay, well, you know, that's 
That's good. But then he ended it with Jesus. Uh, Jesus became the poo. He was crucified outside the camp. He who knew no sin became sin. He became the ultimate sin offering. All of the poo of humanity was placed on him. He was then buried. And in that burial, it turned into fertilizer that started a new creation. I'm like, okay, I just saw Jesus in some poo. (laughs) Someone might think it's a stretch. I shouted. I don't care. I just about, about tackled him when he gave him a high five on that right there. Well, see, that's where we can, we can go mine, we can go mine the beauty. That, that's why we, we have to be very careful because in a lot of like grace camps and movements, people literally are, are just throwing the Old Testament away. Yeah. I'm literally just throwing it out saying, we don't even need it, it's irrelevant, we, 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 it shouldn't even be there. And that's not true because Christ is all over the place in there. We go look for him, but we have to view it through the proper lens. And we find Christ there, and it changes our life. That's when revelation can change us and illuminate us. And I'll, I'll stop with this. My, my mother in the faith went on to be with the Lord about 11 years ago now. And I never, I never forgot this. 1993, sitting at a restaurant in Michigan, she looked at me, and she said to me, she said, son, there's three ways that people's lives are changed and they receive revelation from God. She said the first one is... Uh, impartation. It is where it is another person that writes a book or someone who preaches a message or teaches and you receive an impartation of that truth and it comes alive in you and just transforms you. I mean, uh, you know, listen, they're, they're, you know, you've sat listening to someone teach before and literally just something came alive in you. It, it was a revelation to you now, but it didn't start as a revelation to you. It started as a revelation in them, uh, but then it became a revelation to you. This is said, secondly, there is illumination. That's where you're reading the scriptures, and all of a sudden, it like jumps off the page at you. You see something you never saw. There's something that comes alive, and, and that's something we should actually pray. I, I, believe that, I, I believe that you should literally probably never read the scriptures without actually praying for your eyes to be enlightened because you're reading it through lenses sometimes that we read over because especially if you've been raised in church, you know, when you've heard a thousand sermons or more, I mean, it's so easy. You read a passage and you read right past it and you miss all kinds of truth right there because you're, you're reading it still through an old paradigm or an old lens. And we all, I don't care who you are, every one of us in here, we read with some kind of bias. You cannot read anything without some kind of bias. It has everything to do with how you've been raised, how you've been taught, what you've been around, the different camps you've been exposed to. And she said a lot of people receive illumination. Most people, 80% of what they receive or more is impartation. Some, about maybe 10%, they receive illumination. But she said the, then there's pure revelation. She said revelation is when the Holy Spirit gives you a thought and then he takes you to the scriptures and show you what he's talking about. She said most people never get that because they don't take the time to think. <laughs> I thought that was really good. She says, first of all, you have to actually spend some time meditating. You have to actually think. You have to, you have to allow reason to be okay. That it's okay to actually question and reason things. And, and, and I think what we do sometimes is we just, it's easier for us to just get the impartation rather than actually take the time and allow God to speak to us, to illuminate thoughts to us, and then take us from Genesis to Revelation and say, let me, let me now show you what I'm talking about. Let me... The, let's cross-reference this. Let's look. And then he, he just explodes things off the page. And you know, and when that revelation comes to you, I mean, I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not as much a crier. When, I get, when revelation is hitting me, I mean, I'm, I'm going to shout or laugh. I mean, that's just me. So it's a, <laughs> I mean, I, I just, it, it just bursts out of me in laughter when I get a hold of something that's like, Ugh! You know, like, like good, it's like I'm grasping it, I'm getting it. And that's my response. Some, some personalities, you know, they're just quiet, they're contemplating, not me. All right, it's noisy. I mean, I want to hit something. I want to, <laughs> I don't want to slap somebody. I mean, I'm just something. That's just, that, that, that's just my makeup, right? That's, that's, that's how I am. But the more that I see him, the more that I study, the more that I see Christ, the more I realize how much we've not seen him and how much we've seen through all these different lenses. 
and about how much we've used Scripture to abuse people. Uh, I heard a, an author that I know say this not too long ago. He said, you know, the word, the word Satan is accuser, the one that brings accusation. And he said, any, any time we're using Scripture to accuse somebody, we're being the Satan. That's not what it was used for. Its purpose is to bring healing and life to people, not to bring death to people. Because I can pull some scriptures out and, man, make you feel like a dirty dog. I mean, I, I guarantee you tomorrow, all over this region of Oklahoma, people are going to come to church on a Sunday morning and preachers are going to get up. And they're going to pull out that weapon because that's the lens they view it through. And people are going to leave the building with their tail tucked between their legs, feeling like they're horrible, rotten, nasty, dirty dogs, rather than being taught that they're sons and who the Father is well pleased with. And that they can be a part of now bringing that revelation to others and revealing Christ in others. Instead, we use it as weapons. And it was never meant to be a weapon. It was always meant to bring healing and health. And so I, I, I want to I encourage you, continue to ask the questions. It's all right. Continue to read. Continue to study. Continue to, continue to listen, uh, listen, listen to others that will bring illumination. Uh, you know, you guys, you guys are on here. You guys are, you guys are blessed. There's some solid New Covenant leaders. I mean, Pastor, Pastor Mark views everything through that lens. I mean, his heart is for people. I, I love his heart on just bringing churches together. He works tirelessly. And, and a lot of, a lot, there's a lot that don't reciprocate with that, but I mean, tirelessly to do that and, 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 and out of proper motives, not of just seeing, okay, let's see if I can get a bunch of people because I'm gathering them, I'm going to be their apostle now. No, I mean, it's, it's literally out of a pure motive of, man, we, we want to see Christ lifted up in the region. And I, I love that about him. I love it about his heart. And uh, I'm pretty much done. But uh, I, I encourage you, if, if you haven't got it, the blue series I have back there, I mean, there's 14 hours there pretty much on just all the metaphors and similes and allegories and types and all, all of the different stuff that you can see and view. And, and I don't go into stretching stuff. I mean, it's stuff that's pretty clearly uh, Christ. I try to be try to be careful with trying to find him in places he's actually not. And I already try to squeeze him into little little pegs and holes and uh, that he has nothing to do with, uh, even though he, he might have been in the poo. Uh, I, I, that was one I didn't see. That was one that had to be <laughs> illuminated and imparted to me. But uh, yeah, th thank you for uh, putting together a venue like this. Uh, I know you guys are going to have a great time tomorrow morning. And uh, I know Jeff's going to rock your world again. And uh, uh, tomorrow night, I'm, I'm looking forward to release, uh, uh, release a message uh, called Are We There Yet? And uh, it's all been birthed in me from all this driving back and forth from Louisville back to Michigan with my granddaughter, who were five minutes down the road. Papa, are we there yet? And it's like, you know, we're not going to be there till it's dark. Why are you even asking me, little girl? Five minutes later, are we there yet? And I think it's where the church is because most of the church our whole goal has been, we've been taught our whole goal is trying to get to heaven. And are we there yet? Yep. Uh, we're, not, we're not starting from the premise of trying to get there. We're starting from the premise that we're already there. And it's about bringing there here. And any time we have a mindset of do we have enough, are we there yet, is this the next thing, is this the next move, uh, that, that's when you know you're already living out of a wrong covenant and a wrong mindset. And so uh, it's, it's going to be fun, so I encourage you to also come uh, be a part of that. Thank you, guys. Love you guys. All right, let's give him a hand. Good stuff. <laughs> Looking forward to it. Um, once again, let me just say thanks for coming out this afternoon. Appreciate you guys being here. And uh, we will, uh, this is the live stream still rolling. <laughs> okay, who cares? <laughs> <laughs> i just touch on what he was saying. It's uh, when we have events like this, when he said uh, it's not always reciprocated, is tough. It is the toughest thing I've ever had to do in my life is to try to get a group of pastors together. I usually will spend uh, days and days and hours and weeks ahead of time messaging, texting, calling, emailing, then reminding them, then reminding them again, and I'll get all kinds of confirmations. We're coming. We're bringing groups of students. 
Of course, you can see that who all turned out today. <laughs> I love them. I love them. God love them. If they watch the live feed, I love them. And I know that we, everybody gets busy and stuff. But I'm telling you, it is, it is, uh, it's a thankless job to do that. But I have just a burning passion to connect people, to bring people together, and to bring churches together, and bring ministries together. And so that's not going to die down anytime soon. So it makes me want to thank you even more for being here on a Saturday afternoon. We appreciate it. And uh, avail yourself to the YouTube channel. Uh, it's under the Grace Center's name. Both of these are going to be archived up there, and they'll, we'll, have, we'll save them for, um, like uh, Jeff put out so much information in the first session that you're going to want to go back and revisit that. I know I'm going to several times. So uh, access that. It's Grace Center on YouTube, and you can get to it through the Facebook page or through the website, gracecenter.tv. All of that stuff is on there. So stand up. I'm not going to keep you here any longer this afternoon. Appreciate you guys being out here. I'll just remind you, if you're not doing anything tomorrow morning or tomorrow night, come back out here, 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. All right? Hallelujah. Well, Father, we thank you for the, the gift that Jamie and Jeff both are to the body of Christ. And, Lord, we thank you for uh, the, the opportunity to come together and to just learn to have tools and resources put in our hands to help us encounter you in the study of the Word. I thank you, Lord, where would we be without those encounters, without uh, encounters that have shifted our thinking, shaped our lives, impacted us, set our hearts on fire for you. So we thank you for that, Father. We give you praise for it. I just pray your blessing on your people today. In Jesus' name, amen.